So if you're planning your first Camino, and particularly in the warmer months, something you might be worried about is heat-related illnesses. I'm not a medical professional, so I'm not going to advise you on this, but this week we have with us Dr. Terence Bergman, who is going to give us some tips on those sorts of issues coming right up. So if you're planning your first Camino and it might be in the warmer months, you could be thinking about heat related illnesses. Uh, we've got a specialist with us this week, Dr. Terence Bergman from Winnipeg, which is, I had to look it up on the map. It's kind of right in the middle of Canada, isn't it? <laughs> My house is about 30 kilometers from the longitudinal center of Canada. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. and, and you've just been out for a hike, which is awesome. Yes. And uh, I should point out that you are no newbie to Caminos. You have walked the Camino in the past too. Yes, uh, last September and October, my wife and I did the Camino Francis from St. jean pied de port to Santiago, and then we continued on to Fistera. Lovely. I haven't done that bit to the sea yet. Every time I get to Santiago, I kind of my, my body kind of goes click. You've finished, <laughs> and it won't take me that that extra hundred k's. <laughs> it was a little bit hard because we were the only ones from the group that we had, yeah. you know, the Camino family that we had yeah. created over the month before that was continuing on. Yeah. So we continued, and everyone else stopped, and it felt like a little bit like a wrong thing to do the first two days. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, let, let's get into uh, heat-related illnesses, and we should probably preface this with a little bit of a, um, a disclaimer. So Terence is very kindly sharing some information about medically uh, related, or sorry, heat-related injuries on the Camino. Uh, this is not to be taken as medical advice. You should go and see your medical professional, all that kind of stuff. But he's going to be sharing some really cool things with us. Um, so did you have any sort of health-related issues when you walked your Camino? September could be warm, couldn't it? Yeah, we didn't have too much problems mm. with heat. That was not one of our situations. I have Parkinson's disease and I have two knee replacements. Oh, wow. So part of doing the Camino was now I had new knees and I could go and my Parkinson's was not yet advancing very far that would stop me from going. Mm. So I was in a little bit of a sweet spot and uh, yeah. that made last year the year to go. And I hope it's maybe the first time and we can do one of the other Caminos yeah. at some point in the future again. I'm sure you will. I, th I think that's that's such a sort of <clears> truism <throat> of the Camino for a lot of people who are planning. Sometimes the time is just the time to go, isn't it? And mm -hmm. you know, just go, go when you can. Um, yeah. So. I think one of the things that people are often puzzled about is what's the difference between heat stroke and heat exhaustion? Right. So classically, um, exertional heat stroke and exertional heat exhaustion have been used as two separate diseases. And really, they very much flowed into each other. And the newest terminology is leaning towards just calling it exertional heat illness and letting it be a multitude of little syndromes that sometimes flow from one to the other, depending on whether you're maybe more dehydrated versus hot, or whether there's a medical issue or a, a drug-induced issue that's causing heat to become a far bigger issue uh, than, let's say, muscle injury or muscle damage. Uh, so. Traditionally, it has been that heat exhaustion is the less serious process and heat stroke is the much more serious process. And the cutoff line, if you really want it to be simplistic for people, let's say walking a Camino, is that the difference is that there's uh, changes in mental status oh. in heat stroke that there will be confusion, delirium, maybe agitation or irritability that wouldn't be right for that person uh, that would be telling you something quite serious is going on here. 
Yeah, I, I saw a video um, with, with, with a doctor in the UK recently because I, I sort of started researching it when I was going to talk to you. Um, and that, that bit concerned me because uh, my next Camino, I'll be walking in fairly warm weather on my own on a fairly rope remote Camino. And this idea of you know, com mental confusion and really not understanding what's going on with you. I thought, wow, if I'm walking on my own, that could be a bit risky. So are, are there sort of earlier things to watch out for? Or? Yes. Um, so this is where the most important thing, honestly, in heat illnesses that you can do as a person yourself is just to pay attention to your body. When your body's saying, I'm done, I'm baked, you might actually be done or baked. And maybe you do need to stop and say, I'm taking a break or I'm ending my day here. Um, you know, we all go through a bit of decay as we go through the day. You can start your morning walking four kilometers an hour. Uh, by the end of six hours, you're probably watching, walking two and a half or three kilometers an hour at best. Uh, that is a normal deterioration in ability as you get tired. Uh, that's to be expected. But if all of a sudden something's out of whack and it's like, I've only walked 10 kilometers, but I feel I've walked 30 and I mm. am just, my head's hurting. Like your body's telling you something's wrong. Something is probably starting to go wrong. Mm. And there isn't a lot that you can look at um, as the person who's going through this other than that sort of just feeling that you can, you know, I'm, I'm becoming weak, I'm, I'm becoming slow, I've got a headache, uh, I, I just don't feel good. Uh, that might be all you can get. Um, things that you might not want to think about maybe is that if I feel crummy, maybe I should go to the bathroom. Hmm. Our urine is actually a very important uh, telltale sign of what's going on with the body. When you're well hydrated, Urine is almost colorless. Um, as you get more and more dehydrated, it gets yellower and a darker yellow. If you go to the washroom and it's a very deep yellow, you know right off the hop, you're dehydrated, you're behind in fluids. Uh, but there's also color shifts that occur that can tell you other things are going on. Blood could show up in the urine. Um, the urine could turn brown. Uh, there's a disease called rhabdomyolysis where the muscle breakdown occurs with exertion of you know, overuse, repetitive use of certain muscles. And if you start noticing brown urine, you might be entering a state of rhabdomyolysis where your calf muscles, your quad muscles might actually be breaking down from the exertion. Um, and, and that's just one gauge that you can use along the way. Uh, um, the neurologic abnormalities might be seen more by someone else than what you would see yourself. Uh, things like being disoriented or delirious, you might think you're okay, but someone walking with you might say, what, what, what are we doing? Why are we stopping? Why, why are you talking about going to your in-laws house? We're in Spain, your in-laws aren't here. Mm. Um, you know, something that is out of whack that uh, your co pilgrims might notice that mm. you wouldn't notice yourself okay yeah that that sounds like uh, good advice and I, I can totally relate to that you know if i'm walking on my own you 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 really do have to listen to your body and i know people say this endlessly about the camino but it is so true you you tune into it and you do know if things are a little bit bit out of whack absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if we're walking with someone, that those are the things to look out for then, that, that sort of confused state? Or is, is there anything maybe physical that, that we should notice? There isn't so much physical to go on. Uh, sometimes people will start wandering like they're drunk a little bit. They'll be veering around on the trail. You know, I mean, if you're going up a, a steep trail that has roots and boulders, we all veer around. Wow. That's what you're supposed to be doing. If you'd be stumbling on that and doing a straight line, that would probably be a bad thing. Mm. Um, if you're out on the flat, you know, one of the final trails into Santiago that's 10 feet wide, uh, if you're wandering like a drunk man and you're not drunk, mm. uh, something's wrong. Mm. Um, uh, inability to coordinate. Uh, 
we call it ataxia. Hmm. Uh, people lose their ability to sort of get eye-hand coordination to work, foot-hand coordination to work. Those are late-stage symptoms, though, or signs that someone else might notice. Okay. There, there really isn't that much other than you start noticing they're acting a little bit odd, um, and they're just getting weak. Even making a diagnosis of a heat-related disease on the trail can be really hard because we're hot. It's mm. uh, going to be occurring probably closer to the middle of the day or later on in the day if you're hiking, mm. you know, after lunch. Um, finding a way to sort of say, hey, are you hotter than you're supposed to be? Like, mm. do I know this person enough to put my hand on their um, shady side arm? Let's say their right arm, if we're walking with the sun on our left side, you know, would I put my hand on their arm and would they feel comfortable? Would they be okay if I just touch mm. their arm? It's like, whoa, you're burning up. You know, mm. we've all felt a child with a fever probably mm. and know what that is like when you put your hand on that very hot skin um, to assess if they actually have a heat-related process going on. You need to find some skin that's not in the sun mm. because the sunny side, of course, will be hotter. Okay. Uh, the shady side is where you're going to get your sense that Yes, this person's too mm. hot. Because there could, of course, be many other medical illnesses going on that are not heat-related. It might be a hot day, mm. uh, but maybe this person caught COVID last night in the mm. albergue, and their fever's coming up right now. Mm. And, you know, there they're may not... This is, where, this is where it becomes confusing to try and play doctor mm. on the trail. Yeah. And even for a doctor to play doctor on the trail is a little bit tricky because you just don't have the toys we have at work yeah. to use. I mean, not I, I don't know anyone who's walked the Camino carrying a thermometer to take people's no. temperatures. Uh, I, I don't think that occurs. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a fair one. So, so if we if we notice these symptoms in other people or start to notice it in ourselves, I guess what should we do? The first thing is get out of the sun. Mm -hmm. So there was a um, the U.S. military deals with if you want to go back to the old terminology of heat stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, probably if you so as a Canadian, we get a lot of our literature from the United States. That's just the medical industrial complex that mm. feeds us our data uh, and the US military gleans data on its personnel to help it figure out what mm. to do right and what not to do wrong uh, in getting soldiers from A to B. Um, so heat stroke is a very big US military issue. Uh, I think they have something like around 350 soldiers experience heat stroke requiring hospitalization every summer. Um, they have to sort of figure out, well, so what are we doing wrong? How can we avoid this happening? And they've come up with what they call the wet bulb globe test, which is a three phase um, uh, equation that looks at the dry temperature, the relative humidity, uh, the angle of the sun in the sky and the amount of cloud cover that prevents the sun from hitting you. And you can do a calculation that would tell you, you shouldn't be out here doing anything in the sun. Mm. Uh, you should get into the shade. In the wet bulb globe test, which I hope no one is going to try and figure out on the trail, um, <laughs> the 20% of that value comes from the sun striking you. 20% of your heat that you have is from the sun striking you. That's relative to only 10% of it is due to the temperature of the day. Mm. So getting out of the sun is key. Mm. Uh, getting into shade somewhere. And, and the benefit of the Camino having churches all over the place is there are buildings that have stone walls that might actually have a bit of a cool stone wall. Mm. And if you can get into the shade and find something that is a little bit cooler than the air around you, that's going to help you a little bit. Mm. That's going to chip away at that uh, 20%. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, the big portion of the wet bulb, bulb globe test is relative humidity. 70% of it's relative mm. humidity. 
And if you can't clear or evaporate your sweat, you just keep building up heat. Mm. So the next thing you have to do if you're getting hot or feeling like you're getting too hot or you feel someone that you're hiking with is getting overheated is you've got to somehow get them evaporating water. And if you can't, you've got to get them into something colder so they can cool down their mm. skin and conduct off the heat that the body's building up. Mm. So getting out of the sun and getting into some place where you can start peeling heat off the body mm. uh, whether that's pouring water on the person standing in a hose mm. um, something you know little yeah. creek that's muddy nearby am i going to sit in the creek and get ugly and muddy but i'm yeah. going to survive if i do yeah, that it'll cool you down yeah that, yeah. that raises yeah. an interesting question in my mind because um <clears throat> I, I see a lot of people walking the camino in shorts and short sleeve shirts um, and I probably look a little bit weird because I always walk in long pants, long sleeves. You know, I'm, I'm totally covered up. Um, right. and, it, and it got me thinking a little bit about, you know, evaporation of sweat from the body is important to help us cool down. Should I be wearing short sleeves to help with evaporation more? Well, no and yes. So that's a little bit of a comfort. What is what is my feeling? Hmm. Um, your last name tells me that you're probably Irish in at least Irish part heritage, of your yeah. background. <laughs> so there's that pale skin, maybe freckles, red mm. hair type person Sunburn that easily. is prone yep. to sunburning yep. instantly. Mm. And once you damage the skin, then mm. sweating doesn't function anymore. Yeah. So a sunburn for a person who burns badly uh throws off all of the equilibrium mm. that evaporation can do for a few days mm. after that uh you're much further behind mm. the eight ball than you thought you were mm. so for some people wearing very breathable mm. pants and like long sleeves long mm. pants is the thing to do mm. i got the lucky genetics that if i go outside i turn brown mm. i don't burn um, and I can walk around in a t-shirt and shorts and I will, you know, get some nice bronze color to me, yeah. but I don't burn that easily. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I have an easier time evaporating off mm. the moisture that's on me if I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Mm. But, you know, the Scotsman that is covered in freckles and red hair probably shouldn't do what I'm doing. Mm. So there isn't a right answer to that. Now, if your clothing traps heat in there, like let's say you have your raincoat on mm. and there's something going on that you can't sense how hot you're getting, uh, that sweat is building up, but it's not evaporating mm. off. You're just becoming wet inside yeah. your clothing. That becomes a whole different bad issue there. Mm. So really it's breathable clothing that will allow a wind mm. to take the sweat away uh you can be you know like in long sleeves long pants uh you can have that big hat on mm. that drapes down over the ears and shoulders so you don't burn and you're saving your skin by doing that and guys like me might like what well, you know i might walk past you it's like how can you do that, man? I'd be dying if yeah. I was dressed the way you're dressed. <laughs> I'm good. You're good. Yeah. Uh, we're both surviving in our mm. way that we're made to survive. Mm. And again, it, it comes back to that same comment. We're listening to our body. Mm. Yeah, no, sound, sound advice. Um, so, so what maybe should other, other things that people should be aware of? Because, you know, preferably we want to avoid all of this, not be treating it on the trail. <laughs> truly, truly. Um, looking at risks mm. is a very big issue. Uh, and probably if I, I hate using the word older, cause I get older every year. So I don't like to say that anymore, <laughs> but you know, uh, if you look back at the statistics of heat exhaustion and heat stroke, they occur primarily in people older than 70 and younger than five. Mm. There's not a lot of five-year-olds and two-year-olds walking the Camino. Mm. It's people who are reaching the retired ages mm. of life primarily. So we in that age group have to really watch uh, what's going on with us. And that's because as you get older, 
uh, the portion of the brain that calculates and determines our temperature be starts to fail a little bit. We get we can get what's called autonom autonomic dysregulation, which is a fancy word for the the thermostat inside mm. the brain. The calibration goes off a little bit, and instead of keeping a tight window, it'll mm. allow a bit more spread in temperature. And out in the sun on a humid day, that can make your temperature escalate mm. pretty fast. Uh, so elderly people have a tougher time. Mm. Uh, as a doctor, I write people prescriptions for drugs, and some of those drugs are just terrible things for being in a hot environment and being concerned about heat illness. Mm. Uh, a lot of the psychiatric drugs, because they change the way the brain works, actually set people up for really bad oh. heat illness. Uh, drugs for schizophrenia, some of the drugs for depression, Mm. Uh, are particularly notorious. Um, as you get older and the bladder quits mm. doing what it's supposed to be doing, people take medications to control the bladder. We call them the anticholinergic drugs. Mm. And they can mess up your brain's autoregulation of temperature. People who have fluid building up in the lungs or people who get lots of edema in their legs will be taking diuretics, water pills, mm. uh, to keep the fluid from building up. Well, if you're getting dehydrated already and you take your diuretic because you know you're supposed to do that so your feet don't get swollen, now all of a sudden you're putting out way too much urine mm. and you don't have fluid left in your body for mm. sweat unless you start drinking like crazy. But everyone who gets put on the diuretic gets warned, you're going to feel thirsty, mm. don't go drinking or you defeat the benefit of the oh, diuretic. Wow. Yeah. But on the Camino, it's a different ball game. Mm. And then you get all the drugs that we use for blood pressure control, mm. uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, uh, the, the drugs that are the bread and butter of the lowering the blood pressure industry mm. uh, are also bad for renal function mm. when you get dehydrated. So if you're on a few prescriptions, I think, and you're going to be doing the Camino, my recommendation would be that you chat with your doctor about what you want to do. Mm. You know, I'm going to be leaving southern France in September. It's going to be 27 degrees, and it's going to be in the 20s, and I want to cover 25 kilometers a day. And what do you think of that idea with the drugs I'm taking? Sometimes doctors actually don't know that much about sun-related and heat-related mm. illness in, in respect to some of the drugs, and it might be going to your pharmacist or your chemist and saying, mm. you know, now with my prescriptions, I'm going to do the Camino. We're walking in the sun. What what do I need to look out for with what I'm taking? Mm. And because I'm a doctor, I want to hope doctors would have the answers, but I also mm. know that your pharmacist might give you yeah. a far better, more full explanation than your physician will. Um, and and I think so, you, know, you you raise such a an important point there that we can we all Google stuff you know we look at Doctor Google and we watch videos and so on and yeah. and you know e even this video you know you're sharing some some great general advice for everybody but ultimately yeah. you really got to see your own doctor who knows your history knows your conditions and great. so on and can give give you the right advice. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, a couple of things that I'm going to veer off to that are risks. Yeah. Uh, and these are more maybe for people in a group. Um, and you and I both have gray hair. Uh, so this isn't referring to us, but we, us as males, we still sometimes have this. And that's this feeling of invulnerability that oh, young yes. people have. Um, we all still think, I'm not going to be the one who will crash the car when I drive. It'll be someone else will crash the car. You know, uh, that goes along with, I'm the guy who can finish the 25 or 30 kilometers today. I'm not the guy who has to stop. Mm -hmm. And it's that sort of feeling that I'm going to be invulnerable is your enemy on the trail. Mm -hmm. um, peer pressure. Uh, people who, you know, four guys from work or four guys from church get together and say, let's go walk the Camino and one of them didn't prepare, three of them prepared, three of them are ready to walk pretty fast and pretty far. The one says, I've always been able to do whatever I want to do, so I'm sure I can mm. take off and do this. Maybe they can't anymore. And 
trying to keep up with your yeah. peers and feeling that sense of I got to keep going puts you at risk of heat exhaustion, mm -hmm. uh, heat illnesses. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've watched the uh, the movie I'll Push You or if you've uh, mm -hmm. heard the story of I'll Push You, the the American in the, the wheelchair whose friend basically pushed him through the Caminos. Mm -hmm. I guess it was 2017 maybe or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember when it was. Um, people who have spinal cord disease, and that's really not their situation, but that mm -hmm. just made me think of it, is uh, if you were going to push somebody on the Camino and they're a spinal cord injured person, they have no ability to choose to sweat or not sweat below the level of their spinal cord injury. Yeah. Uh, so the body will choose to sweat if it wants to, and it could do that at 40 below in winter, mm. but it might choose not to do it at 40 above in wow. summer. And so you, you might think, I'm the one pushing the wheelchair. I'm the one that has to pay mm. attention to Am I going to get heat exhaustion from pushing this other person? But it might be the person sitting in the chair mm -hmm. is the one that would get the heat exhaustion because of their cord injury. Us folks with Parkinson's, as Parkinson's progresses, we get the same autonomic dysfunction. The part of the brain that controls temperature starts mm -hmm. to fail. And temperatures can fluctuate quite wildly and the ability to sweat or not sweat can also disappear. So I'm going to tell you I don't look forward to that possibility. Um, di diabetics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a diabetic that gets dehydrated can get very sick very quickly. Um, they have to be much more conscious about checking their sugars and keeping their water intake and keeping those two in balance uh, so that they don't have problems with the diabetes getting mm. messed up. Uh, I'm rambling, I think. No, no, no. That's that's, that's no, I'm, I'm taking all of this in. It's um, I, I, I'm just thinking that you know we started off talking about um, heat-related um, conditions like this. Um, actually, I think what you've shared with us is sure some things to look out for and and some things to avoid. But I think almost more importantly is all of these conditions that a lot of us have, you know, how these can actually complicate things <clears throat> and, and why right. if, if we have anything wrong with us at all, we really got to be talking to our doctor and saying, look, this is what I'm planning to do. What should I look right. out for? You know, I think that's probably one of right. the biggest messages I'm getting from talking to you today. And that's probably one of the biggest ones I want to get across. Yeah. Because I think we can do more to try and prevent ourselves from getting mm. into this situation than uh, trying to get ourselves out of it. Because mm. on the trail, there isn't a ton that we can do. Mm. In, in, in the world of prevention, um, one of the things that a lot of us don't have time to do when we do the Camino is to arrive in France or Spain and spend a week not actually going hard at the Camino right away. Um, if you look at professional athletes going to different environments to competitions, um, you know, classically, um, medically, we look at the Mexico Olympics in 1968, yeah. where there was heat and uh, terrible smog and elevation all in the same place. Mm -hmm and they knew they had to get their teams there two or three weeks beforehand just so they could acclimate to mm. the air to the humidity to the temperature if you're coming out of seattle and you're going to end up in lyon or burgos on your first day in the middle of summer it's going to be a dramatic hit to your body mm. going from 20 and maybe a coolish feeling 20 to you know burning sun and 30 degrees, 35 degrees Celsius, uh, you know, it would be great if we all could say, yep, I'm going to go to the Camino, I'm going to fly into Spain for a week, and I'm going to wander around yeah. Spain for a week, not doing too much, not trying to climb hills too much, just getting used yeah. to the sun and to the humidity, and then a week later, I'm going to go do my Camino, and we would have a lot less trouble getting to Roncesvalles uh, from St. John. But that, but that reinforces the need, really, doesn't it, to, to start slow. And, you know, yes. one of the 
lovely sayings I hear about the Camino is that, uh, you know, if you want to finish like a young man, start like an old one. Um, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and taking those first few days easy and acclimating, like you say, and easing into it is probably so important. Yeah, yeah. Um, eating regularly, drinking mm -hmm. regularly. Uh, we had one day, uh, you know, right now, I, I think it was on the way to Rabanal. I, I actually can't think of it right now. Um, but it was a Sunday and almost everything was closed. Oh, yeah. There's only a couple of small stop. villages between Astorga and Rabanal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was really nothing that we could find. Mm. And we had packed along enough snacks and we carried enough water that we made it there. But when we pulled into town, we had a dry water pack mm. and we had eaten all of our snacks. If we would have been forced to go on for some reason or to be stranded somewhere for some reason, we had used up all of our sort of buffer reserve mm. that we had, mm. you know, put into the packs. Mm. Um, regular fluid intake, regular food. Um, the Camino was probably not the place to start fasting. No. <laughs> uh, that would be the thing to do. Um, yeah. Okay. Preparation. I, again, listening to your body. Listening yeah, to your yeah. body. And, and, and that's an important point about the water intake as well. You know, and we could talk for another half an hour about hydration probably, but be, being aware of where you're going to be able to top up water and how much to carry with you. and. Right. You know, you, you you might be planning to stop in that village to top up your water, but what if the water fountain's not working? You know, where's the right. next one? Where's the right. alternate? Yeah. Yeah. Or what's my comfort zone on knocking of the door of someone who doesn't speak my language? That's right. And like, agua, agua. agua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, don't get in trouble when a little bit of embarrassment can keep you yeah. out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think we've probably covered it. Is, is there anything else you'd like to, to share? Um, you know, treatment, treatment, the, the, the three most important things about mm -hmm. treating people who have heat related illnesses are cool them down, cool them down, and cool them down. Mm -hmm. And if you can cool them down, that's, that's where the money is all located. Yeah. Um, if you're in the middle of nowhere and the only water you have is the water that, you know, the people around mm. you, the pilgrims around you are yeah. carrying, like Alto del Perdon, uh, you know, we got up there and mm. uh, uh, there was someone who was feeling quite ill and mm. I don't think it was heat exhaustion. I think they were ill, mm. uh, but you know, it's like, well, we have this much water. And, and we can give you this. Mm. Like we can give away our water because we know where our next water supply yeah. is. Yeah. Briarly, Briarly told me where my next water fill up was. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, get a person in the shade, get water yeah. into them, get water onto them, yeah. and do whatever you can to cool them down. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an important and, point. And, and, you know, don't don't be afraid to ask for help. Help each other out. I, I can yeah. remember uh, oh, heading up from. Um, Oh, up towards San Juan, up that big hill and through the forest. And there was a guy who was suffering a bit with the heat, you know, and I, I shared some of my electrolytes and stuff with him, you know, and it was like, oh, wow, that's that's great stuff, you know. So yeah. uh, it's, it's always nice to have a little bit extra that you can share with someone else. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. We're there to carry each other along. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I think we've probably done that topic. So uh, Dr. Terence Bergman from Winnipeg, right there in the middle of Canada, and uh, whose who's normal job is you're an ER physician, I understand. So, uh, yes. yeah. Do you, yeah. do you get a lot of um, heat-related injuries in Winnipeg? We don't. I mean, in summer it gets really hot, mm. but the heat doesn't usually persist through the night. Mm. Uh, and we're in an area where air conditioning is just a, a mandatory part of life. Yeah. Uh, definitely when you get areas of the country that aren't used to the heat mm. and then they get a crazy heat spell and mm. people don't have air conditioning that's when you start getting the news reports mm. of you know people becoming ill and dying uh when they just they can't cool down they, they can't do those first mm. three important things of cool mm. down cool down cool down um to, to digress for a second a very interesting yeah. point you raise you're used to having air conditioning i'm used to having air conditioning in australia 
guess what, right. folks? If you've never walked a Camino, there's not a lot of air conditioning in Spain. There's not it? a lot. There's not a lot of air conditioning. <laughs> you will check into places, and aircon is, you know, that's the cream on the cake. You don't often get it. <laughs> no, no. Yes, that's correct. So that that's could correct. be a shock for some people. Yeah. All right, Terence, thank you very much for joining us. I, I know this is, um, you know, it's an important topic. People are people, particularly who haven't walked to Camino, worry about. Uh, heat-related illnesses, and I, I think sadly there have been a couple of deaths this year because it's been especially yes, hot. There. So I yeah. think it was a great time to to talk about this topic. So thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Rob. 